Good morning. So I wonder if it's a coincidence that the health session is just after the official party. But um, about health. So do you know what's the definition of health by WHO, the World Health Organization? It's the it's complete state of physical, mental and social well-being. So the bar is pretty high. The expectations are pretty, pretty high. And it's uh, when you have services uh, with, that with a click you can get the transport, you can get the food delivery, but you don't get healthcare services with the same easiness in a digital society even, uh, then you get frustrated. And it's a challenge uh, because and there's a reason for that, because healthcare is hard. Building in healthcare in general is hard. There are lots of different stakeholders, everyone keeping their own ground. There's lots of tradition. There are regulations which, by the way, are for your safeguard quite often, but also regulations tend to start to live their own lives and, and keep innovation like on the backside. So and there's also the aspect of uh, tradition, clinical culture, because for centuries, healthcare has been about data, and it still is, but the ultimate data processor has been the doctor in a room with a patient with uh, speak and visual aid. And the healthcare systems and the model of healthcare system, the financing of the healthcare system, has been built on this assumption. But unfortunately, these are 20th century technologies. Even pills are 20th century technologies. But the healthcare system isn't, hasn't adjusted, the regulations, the background hasn't adjusted for the 21st century technologies, which are quite a lot about data. And at the same time, uh, there's lots of data piling up in the healthcare se sector and outside of healthcare sector, which can be used for better health. But at the same time, well, building in health and building on health data is not the same as a building, for example, in transportation. For example, machine learning. If you optimize uh, Taxify, for example, uh, or some transport app, uh, and you optimize the route delivery with machine learning, then it doesn't really, uh, it's, it's not a big problem if the algorithm makes your uh, taxi late. Or the same with the marketing machine learning, that uh, the, the client doesn't convert at 40%, uh, uh, converts at uh, 35 But if you use machine learning in healthcare, then it, it might be a problem if uh, the algorithm suggests a new course of treatment or the dose is uh, 30 instead of uh, 20 of some, some pharmaceutical. So you cannot build in these automatic uh, machine learning models in, in healthcare because on one part uh, there's the regulations which haven't adapted to this kind of new model and on the other part, it's the whole, on the other part, it's for your own safeguard. On the other part, it's for actually protecting human lives. So, but at, so we, what we actually need is new models of delivery and new models of financing in the healthcare system. And this is the role quite often for entrepreneurs, uh, for thought leaders who we'll see on stage soon. They are searching new models of how to use health data from other sources, how to get their own health data and build science on that, and how health data could help um, to use your, to provide better uh, services. So I'm happy to invite on stage uh, the Alan uh, as the next speaker, but also Ida will talk and Tunu. And Alan from Datalytics is working on data which can be used for health, but you one would not assume that it's health data. Ida has built a Women Health App Clue, which has 11 million active users. This is a really good um, result for a health app. And Tunu will t from Estonian Biobank will talk about how we could use genetic data 
uh, into improving our health. But now, Alan. Right, I'm very happy to see that some people at least have turned up. Um, I have to give you two warnings. Um, I'm going to talk, or some of my talk is about something that most people don't want to hear, and uh, especially the ones who are not here, uh, because it's about behavioral um, uh, yeah, uh, patterns, uh, which are not always good, especially not for people in the uh, innovating and entrepreneurship, and also not for party goers. Um, the second thing is I come from, I have a, I have a background as, uh, uh, from the insurance world, and uh, so I'm extremely well trained in scaring people. Um, so don't, don't get too scared, but it is something that you have to, uh, to take notice of. Okay, let me tell you a little bit about uh, datalytics. Um, as you can see on the picture, that is not Estonia. Uh, this is Singapore, and the, the reason is that we are originally a Singaporean company. Um, started about five years ago, um, and in the meantime, we have also established an R&D setup in Scotland, uh, where we work quite closely with, uh, with, with the universities there. Um, let me give you a little bit of context uh, before I go to the, to the practical uh, examples of, of what we have done. So we, as I, as I already said, we, take, uh, we, we look at things that, that most people are maybe aware of, but they live a little bit in denial. Uh, but these, these things are, are big, big problems for society. So, uh, yeah, there's, there's, there's something wrong with our, in most countries, there is something wrong with our uh, lifestyle behaviors. Um, people do not always understand what what influence sleep has on their, on their health, and, and, and in, especially over the long term, uh, it's, it's, it can be devastating, actually. Uh, it, this, is, this is not some, something, I mean, I haven't slept very well last night and I don't feel good today. No, this is, this is continuously and accumulating uh, in, in, in a, over a longer period of time. It's, it causes many, many diseases. Um, it, it, it has influence on, on, on many, many, many things in your life uh, that, that, that people don't even understand. Um, fatigue is a, is, a, is a problem, and, and fatigue is, again, it's not something about, yeah, I feel, I feel a bit tired. No, this is about fatigue levels to a level where it actually influences your long-term health. Uh, and, 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 and calls, I mean, uh, if you look at, at the, the causes of, of, for example, diabetes, I mean, uh, not sleeping very well and not, sleeping, not, not having very good sleeping patterns um, is, is, is a big cause of that. Uh, aging is a, is a, especially in the Western world, is a, is a, is one of the things that we have to take in, into our mind, um, and then this all almost results in unsustainable healthcare costs, and that's that's not only in the Western world, that's that's all over the world. Um, so we have to do something about it. This is a this is a global problem. Um, so this is the typical, uh, yeah, uh, people living in in, in denial. Um, yeah, I don't have to, to, to go into too much detail here because uh, obesity is, is, is obviously a problem um, in, in some countries. Uh, if, I don't know if you went lately to the US or, or, or to the UK, even, even to India or China, I mean, obesity is, is very, very present in, 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 uh, in, in, in the street. I mean, you, you, can, you can see it, you can feel it. Um, there are a, a lot of stress-related uh, problems as well. Uh, mental health is, 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 is not always recognized and it's not always taken care of in the right way. Um, diets are, are not, not very good. Uh, we basically, you could say that, that we, we haven't adapted to the big meals and, 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 and yeah, loads of proteins that we get in. And, and, and again, that has consequences on our, on our, our uh, health in, in the longer term. Uh, alcohol and substance abuse, um, not always fully recognized, but th there is a problem in, in, in many cases. Uh, and, and as I already mentioned, yeah, the sleep, sleep is, a, is, a, is, a, is a big issue that, that has been underestimated. So um, one thing is, is, is very important for you to understand is that lifestyle really, really impacts your, your health and, and your work as well. And, and it's, it's, it's about your private life, but it's also about your social life. And, and, and your, your, your work situation. Um, 
of course, there are people who are already recognizing this and, and they do something with it, but normally what, what, we, what we then do is we, we measure one data point, or one, not, not one data point as such, but uh, one data set. And, and, and yeah, this is a much more complex problem. It's, it's, it's a combination of many factors. And so you, have to, you, you can't just solve this problem with looking at one thing. I mean, it's not only about sleep, it's not only about diet, it's, it's, it's a combination and it's accumulation, and, and that makes it really, really difficult to, to, uh, to, to handle. Um, so it's not, it's not because, I mean, it's not because all of a sudden uh, you start to, to run and, and, and to, that, that you will be healthy. I mean, that's, that's not the point. If you continue to smoke and, and drink uh, and, and, and eat the wrong things, you will not get healthier, actually. It, it might, running might be worse for you, actually. So you have to be careful. Um, yeah, we, we also, what we haven't done is, is actually establish the base of somebody's situation. And that is really what we try to address. Is that there is no uh, way until now, uh, what we have seen, is that this is your situation, this is the risk you run. And with my insurance background, I, can, I, I see risks everywhere. Um, so, and, and, so you, you have to manage that risk, but if you don't know what the risk is and you don't understand what, what, what is going on, how can you manage that? Um, the, the benchmarks are, are also not necessarily the right ones. Uh, they, they are a bit confusing. Um, so when your benchmarks are, are, are not correct, uh, main, yeah, many of these benchmarks are based on averages. The problem is that nobody here unless you are coinc coincidentally, uh, is an average. I mean, it's your own situation. Uh, but the whole, yeah, the whole regulation, for example, is built on around averages. Uh, it, it's, and so, so if you then start to, to build solutions around averages, then that is not personal enough. That, that is not accurate for, for, for you as a, as a person, unless you are, by accident, the average. Um, there's also a little bit too much uh, data almost because yeah every heartbeat of your body is a data point so so uh, that, that there's there's loads and loads and loads of, but not enough uh, knowledge we think right um, so I'm I'm not gonna go into uh, the details here but uh, what we already know is is, is known uh, the lifestyle as such remains a bit of a, of a black box so we don't we don't really fully understand the impacts of your daily behaviors. Uh, what, what are the impacts of weight changes, uh, the impact of fatigue, readiness for work, all these things are, are still a bit of a, of a black box. And we try to open that black box. Uh, so, yeah, the conclusion, uh, lifestyle has an impact and, and we can actually measure it. How do we do that? Um, this is, uh, we, we actually have developed four platforms um, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not here to promote what we do, so uh, I'm going to, uh, to, to just to say that the life is your, your own personal uh, platform um, that, where you can see uh, what your lifestyle profile is and also what the lifestyle's impacts are. Uh, then the health, Delta and Phi, uh, they are more on, on a corporate level where you can actually manage uh, personnel and, and, and people and, and, and shifts and what have you uh, through these, uh, they, they are more managerial uh, platforms. Uh, so the way we do it, uh, we, we take uh, input from uh, lifestyle data sources, um, mainly uh, we work through wearables but also questionnaires. Uh, could be doctor's uh, information. I mean, whatever, whatever we, 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 get, we can get, we can add to the, to the algorithm. Um, so then we, we, we put that in an algorithm. We do medical valuation, uh, validation, um, uh, mathematical models, AI and machine learning. And then we come to applications. And the applications actually are endless. I mean, th these are just a couple of them. But if you think about it, how, how it works, then it's, you, you, can, you can almost... Uh, you can, you, can, you can start a new economy, actually, or at least a new economic model. Um, and then that, that goes into uh, results and outcomes, because if you, if you have no solution for this, then, um, then yeah, th th there's no point in, in knowing all these things, of course. Um, so a little bit more about uh, we, we have, uh, we, we are not, I mean, as I said, we, we started five years ago. Until now, we have done almost 
exclusively uh, R&D. Uh, so this is very scientific based uh, by data science, medical doctors, and, uh, and, and, and software engineers. I mean, 95% of the people who work in data analytics are, are in this category. Um, now we, we start to commercialize, um, but, um, but, but we continue to do the R&D. That, that, that's for sure. So a couple of examples of what we have done in the past. Um, so this is a, a health enhancement program in, 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 with a university in Singapore. Um, we monitored uh, some medical students because we saw that, yeah, actually stress and, and fatigue with students is, is, is quite a, a big problem. Uh, again, underestimated. And so uh, Singapore is quite proud of its, uh, of its system and, and, and they want to produce the best students in the world. Uh, but yeah, it's not about the, having the best teachers and, 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 and giving a, a lot to learn. No, it's also about creating a good environment where people can work and, and understanding why some people are better in, 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 in things than, than and, and others aren't. So what, what, what we did, we, we, we took some wearables, uh, we measured uh, physical activity and sleep, uh, and what we saw is that um, yeah, by people understanding what was going on, uh, they understood that a little bit more sleep was actually having a big impact on their study results. And so, so the more you, you and the more they understood what was going on, uh, they, they changed their, their lifestyle. And th the nice thing about this is that it also it had consequences for their environment. I mean, for, for, for their social. Um, environment. So, so they, they actually spoke about it to their families. The families actually adapted, uh, uh, they bought into it. So it, it, has, it had a bit of a, a viral effect, which we didn't expect uh, at the beginning. And um, even when, when we, we stopped with this, I mean, it's actually, uh, yeah, the, the people after, after this, uh, they continue to do it. I mean, and, and they had, they had um, yeah, they, they, they lived in a, in a different way forever, basically. I mean, they, they, they didn't go back to their uh, old patterns. Uh, so we, the, the, as, a, as a benefit, you get healthier medical students, which is not, not unimportant, um, because doctors are not necessarily the, the most uh, healthy um, uh, group in the world. Uh, actually, the, the reason why this company was, was, was started is, is because uh, doctors, we saw a pattern going from, from doctors going in, um, yeah, they, they were a bit depressed, uh, they, they got in a, in a very deep mental uh, health uh, problem uh, situation, and, and some of them even committed suicide. And that's, that's all because the, of, of, of their lifestyle. Right, um, I only have two minutes, so I'll, I'll, I'll go quite, uh, so I already spoke about uh, some hospital. This, this is about nurses. Um, we, we, we compared two shifts, and then we found out that one shift actually had very bad results on the health and, 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 and the situation of people. Um, so, so we tried to, to, yeah, the conclusion was don't use that kind of uh, shift work uh, and, and, and change the, the, the setup there. Um, then this is also applicable to, uh, to, to, to for example, truck drivers. Uh, we, did a, we did a study in, in, in China. Uh, where we followed some truck drivers, uh, found out that, that um, just by changing a couple of things, uh, yeah, they, they, they were an incredible, I mean, I think it was 80% uh, less accidents, just by letting them sleep in a different place, because they, their sleep pattern was completely messed up, because they slept somewhere where they shouldn't be sleeping. But, but they were, it was mandatory by the company to sleep there, and, and that was not a good idea. So, uh, so, 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 yeah, there were a lot of accidents, but people didn't understand why the accidents were there. <laughs> so so by, by just looking into this. And then um, as, a, as a last example, uh, and that's still ongoing, actually, and, and here it says seven pilots, but it, actually in the meantime, it's more than 40 pilots. Um, we, yeah, the pilots are probably the most complicated shift workers in the world because it's, they have very strange shifts and, and, and very irregular shifts, but they also have to go through, some of them at least, have to go through different time zones. So that makes it very, very complicated to understand what's going on. And, and, but what we find out is that, that people, there are some people who, who are much better in, uh, in, in, in going east to west than west to east. Um, and, 
again, and, and that's, that's the danger, is that, that for pilots, for example, all the regulation is built around, um, not, not, not around the pilot itself, it's built around averages, and, and, and yeah, some people can cope with, with a rest time of 24 hours. Some are, are not, some only need 12 hours, uh, but that is not taken into account uh, to their work shift at all. I mean, they, 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 nobody knows. I mean, they, but we can establish the base for that, so we can actually individualize all these things uh, in, in, in quite, a, quite a good way. I mean, jet lag uh, management is another thing that we do, uh, also for the pilots, but also for the passengers, uh, and that's actually uh, commercially um, uh, launched now. Okay, that was it. Thank you. Thank you. And next up is uh, Ida from Clue. Uh, she will be talking about how women tech could be disrupted. Thank you. I work in health because I care about people. And I know that we can do amazing things with data so that we can help people live in tune with these amazing systems that we have and not in spite of them. But there are also a few challenges, and I'd like to tell about both what we're doing with data, but also how, we are, how I'm thinking about some of these challenges that we have, both as users, but also as founders of tech companies. So first of all, why do I care about female health and not health more broadly? Well, we have four primary sex hormones that goes up and down the whole time that governs pretty much everything in our bodies. And this is men's. So the fact is that women have a set of life experiences and health issues that are just very unique. So, let's see. Sorry, this is really, really multitasking. Um, yeah, so my name is Ida. I'm the CEO and founder of Clue. So we have built an app that helps women track their cycles um, to better understand what is going on in their bodies. We provide scientific, valid health information that they don't find other places. And by doing that, we liberate the knowledge that people actually have inside themselves. But for those of you who maybe haven't come across this type of product, for good, obvious reasons, I think it's worth noting that period tracking is actually the most searched for term in the app stores more search for than fitness, meditation, running. And this is a category that is on the rise. So as our moderator, I can't pronounce your name, said, we have well over 11 million active users. And we are just one example of a whole category in tech that we have coined a term for called femtech that's on the rise. So this is technology that is addressing the needs that women have because of this unique biology. <clears throat> so it makes sense to collect data around the female cycle because there is a lot of stuff going on. <laughs> Not just the bleeding and the mood changes that you all maybe think about, but there is things happening to our immune system, it affects how we build muscle tissue. Our sex drive is impacted. So all these ways, it affects our daily lives. And actually, I would say the scientific world is only just starting to learn about the correlation between our cycles and our health more broadly, how it relates to our chronic diseases, how it relates to our mental health, how it relates to um, 
how we take medication, even our sleep. I think it was really interesting that the previous speaker had this list of things that affect our health, and f the female cycle was really missing. <laughs> so we need to start tracking more data and learn more about this. Now I got my speaker notes down there. Thank you, guys. I love you. <laughs> I can put this down. So what we do at Clue is that we connect various variables, so the Oura Ring, Fitbill, Apple Health, but primarily people track the things that we don't yet have sensors for. How much am I in pain? How much am I bleeding? What's my sex life feeling like? All these different things, my digestion. And we have people track all this data. And we have really put a lot of effort into making this UI an enjoyable experience. There is so much taboo, there is so much stigma in this field that we wanted to maybe even put a smile on people's face as they track this and as they do it day after day, month after month. And we, we, we strive to be inclusive, uh, we strive to be emotionally intelligent, and to be not talking down to people. This is a category where there's a lot of butterflies, there's a lot of pink, and we actually just want to be on eye level with people and take them seriously. So I want to show one example of one user who tracked. So she didn't just track her period, she tracked a bunch of other things. She tracked her sleep, um, her skin, her digestion, her medication, her pain, lots of different things. And that's when Clue becomes really useful. It's when we start drawing correlations between what's happening with my cycle and all these other areas of life. So she tracked about 2,400 data points over a period of two and a half years. Um, and she does that because she wants to understand her, how her cycle relates to other parts of her life. I want to show you one example, because of course the question, so now she has all this, all this data, what do we do with it? What does she get out of it? And this is one example I want to show, where we do more advanced things with data than just telling her when her next period is coming. Um, this is our irregular cycle feature. Um, it helps people understand if they might have a condition called PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome, which is a condition about 10% of women have. So it's really common, and yet it's very hard to diagnose. We cannot diagnose, we're not regulated to diagnose, but we can help people see that they might want to go have that conversation with their doctor and bring the data to their doctor. Um, so, and PCOS, um, it, can co it causes irregular cycles, but it can also cause infertility and a whole slew of other health problems, increased risk of diabetes and many other things. So let's see if I, this is a 30 second demo showing what this feature looks like. Users get a notification in Clue if the cycles they've been tracking are clinically irregular. Then we ask if they'd like to find out what's going on. We ask a series of questions related to PCOS and irregular cycles. These questions include how old they were when they had their first period, what their exercise habits are like, and whether or not they've been limiting their calorie intake. We always ask about excess hair growth, which is a key symptom of PCOS. The feature uses a Bayesian network to determine which questions to ask. We ask the fewest questions possible to get an accurate, meaningful result. At the end, users learn if they have a high likelihood of having PCOS or whether something else might be going on. They're given a report with all of the relevant information for their doctor. Later, we follow up with these users to learn if they've received a diagnosis. So, on average, it takes a doctor seven years to diagnose PCOS. That means a lot of years of something's going on in my body, I don't understand what it is, I'm in pain, things are weird, and I'm not getting the care I need. With this, we can do it in as little time as three months. So, I think that's, a, you know, that's helpful. Um, and it, I believe that this kind of Tech can help people live self-directed lives. She can take responsibility and get care, make sure that she, you know, potentially have the children she wants to have, for instance. 
So one thing I've learned building um, consumer tech and in health is that it's not enough to just give people um, a data point. You know, so, okay, your cycle is 40 days. What does that mean? What, you know, what am I going to do? So we really need to provide context for people as well. We need to educate them so they know what does this mean to me. And one way that we are doing that is that we're building a lot of content which is very scientifically based. We spend a lot of resources making sure everything is fact-checked. Um, so it's really high-quality, trustworthy information. Um, can you make my speaker notes take up more of the screen? Because I actually don't see the bottom parts of my speaker notes. <laughs> this is really interesting. So, you know, we can see that women are around the world, they want to live self-directed lives. We can see this it's a cultural shift that's happening around the, the planet. Um, and I know that knowledge and data and tech can help women do that. And these women are the reason why we are pushing the boundaries of AI and data to help women live these self-directed lives. We want them to have agency both of their data, their body, and their lives. So, at the same time, I will say we are covering billions of data points of the most intimate kind. And for me, that means that I have a huge responsibility to have the highest ethical standards and to do everything I can to keep that data protected. So, for instance, I have, as a CEO and founder, decided I'm not going to sell people's data, full stop. I don't think it's the right thing to do. That's my ethical stance. And I must say that we live in an industry climate where this is not the norm. There are a lot of tech founders out there who look at this quite differently than I do. And I believe that we have a huge task ahead of us as a tech community to actually develop best practices for how we think about people's data. And we have a big challenge in educating users enough to demand that we take good care of their data. And we also have a challenge as society to regulate to make sure that people like me take good care of people's data. Another big question, I think, as a health data company is, you know, we are not neutral. There is no single point of truth. You know, what features we decide to develop, how we talk to people, what we set as, you know, statistical norms, our probability, like this whole interaction with our users, you know, we are communicating our beliefs. And so we need to really think about, you know, where are we coming from? What are the norms we're passing on? You know, my aim is to give people a voice. I want them to be able to go down to their doctor's office and advocate for themselves. I want them to be able to bring the data and say, you need to provide good care at the right moment. This is not standard at the moment. I need people, I want people to be able to assess risk of what medical procedures they're going through or what medication this they get. You know, right now, a lot of medications are not tested on women because we have cycles and it's very inconvenient. It messes up the data. <laughs> you know, we need to educate people enough so they can go out and say, no, you need to take me seriously. And this is what I believe we can do with this data and with tech. We can give people the chance to live self-directed lives. I'm proud to say that I believe that we have earned people's trust in the six years that we've been doing this. Um, I don't take that trust for granted. This is something we earn every day by making big and small decisions and doing the right thing consistently. As I said, I believe that as guardians of this really precious data, we must serve our users, but I actually also feel we must serve society at large, and that's why that we have, with users' full consent, done a lot of science collaborations 
with some of the foremost universities in the world. And this is a way for us to bring new knowledge, to create new knowledge, and bring that back to the people who gave the data, our users. All these women who just want to be able to live their lives in, in tune with their biology and not kind of overwhelmed by it. So for instance, the PCOS feature that I showed you, we built together with Boston University. Um, one of the world's greatest researchers on that. Um, and I think this is, you know, it's a great way for us to govern this data in a respect respectful and responsible way and bring something back to the users that has value for them, but also for society. So I know that technology can support people, but we need to really take a good look at tech and the tech industry at the moment. And I will say I'm happy to call out bad players when I see them. <laughs> because just the last few weeks, there's been examples of um, um, data companies in the female health space selling the data to employers to know about employees' fertility journeys. For me, that's a no-go. There has been examples of um, Facebook knowing when you're on your period. I don't think that's Facebook's business. We need to enable people, users, consumers, to demand that we take better care of the data than that. That's part of my task. It's part of everybody's task. And that's how we get to live self-directed lives in tune with our biology and not in spite of it. Thank you. And thank you for enjoying all the tech stuff. So good morning, everyone. <clears throat> so I have a, a starting question. Like, you know, who of you is a big favor of the GMO, so genetically modified organisms. Just please show your hand. So I see one couple of enthusiasm. So it's if the others are not support, then you actually are, you know, hating yourself, you're hating your, your friends, you're hating your families, because we all are made of uh, DNA. All our cells have DNA in it. And, uh, and it's a molecule of two and a half meters long and has 3.3 billion uh, building blocks. And if I take my own genome and I take, for example, the next speaker, uh, Inavixo's genome, we on average different on three million positions. And then by definition, we are genetically modified and maybe not modified by, by the state or, or the crazy scientists, but actually modified by the nature. And now the question is, if we have those differences in the genome. You know, can we use this information to uh, advance the healthcare, live a healthier life? Uh, previous speakers already showed like how important it is to know the data. So I have a couple of examples that maybe illustrate how the genetic data can help us to live a healthier life, and in the end maybe come up with uh, you know better tools and services for healthcare, but maybe even end up with much smarter and better trucks. So a simple uh, uh, cartoon. So we are born, uh, and that when we're born, we get our DNA from your parents. You know, half comes from mother, half comes from the father. You know, no one is uh, perfect, everyone has mutations. And, you know, good news is that no one of you has all the genes bad, but the bad news is that you, everyone, among you has some bad mutations. And which means that uh, those mutations remain the same throughout the life. And then other factors that affect our health is you know, age, you know, the organism, the system gets older, you know, mechanisms you know, wear down, but it's also our, our lifestyle. So we get born, everything is chill, you know, no health risk factors, just the genes, as good as we get them. But then we get, you know, older, in kindergarten we eat a little bit dirt and, you know, other, other stuff, you know, we go to uh, maybe secondary school, you know, start uh, 
drinking beer occasionally, you know, smoke weed, uh, and then when you go to you know, university or finish the university or become a you know, successful founder, you know, don't do sports anymore, and basically your you know, picture of health literally gets full. And then at some point, uh, you, will be, you will get the illness. So, but as we all are different and we kn know the genetic uh, differences and the genetic risk is different, if you know that we have a higher risk, for example, diabetes, so maybe we put a little bit more effort into you know, being healthy, moving a little bit more. So this was you know, health behavior. Another thing that is also quite <coughs> interesting is, is you know, use of drugs. So on a, on usually you, know, you, you get a disease, you get just you know, one kind of a drug, but, but we are different because we are genetically different. And for some people, you know, the drug works just fine. You know, the dosage that the doctor prescribes is good for you. But for others, for example, the drug has effect, but the dosage is wrong. So you also have, have toxic effects. So you have side effects. There are some cases where, where there is no effect of, of treatment from the drug, but you still have the side effects. Or there is no effect uh, and it's toxic. Actually, the blue ones I meant were, you know, you don't have any effect, but it's not toxic. Basically, it's just a burden for the health carrier, just, uh, you know, burning all the money unnecessarily. So if you have this kind of uh, ideas in mind, what we need to test those, you know, then we need a you know, big data collection to do it. And fortunately, here in Estonia, we have the Estonia Biobank, where we, by the end of this year, will have 200,000 people's DNA, genetic profiles, health data. So we can now start to ask questions and think on ways how to integrate this data into the healthcare model. Um, then we also have, because of the excellent X-Road and, and state-provided infrastructure, we basically have everyone's health data from the point it, it became electronic. And it gets richer and richer you know, over the time. So we have millions or even billions of data points about health behavior, you know, treatment behavior, how your body reacts to the treatment <coughs> in the background of, of your genes. So, and everyone has genetic profiles available. So basically doing the <coughs> research, doing the R&D actions is, is very cost efficient. And obviously, in order to you know, test the things, you have to have technology. And in this graph, you know, it's not important to have the details, but it just illustrates like how often we retrieve data from the national registers. Basically, it takes us less than a month to get the past year uh, health insurance, uh, health data, uh, you know, from the health insurance, and integrate this into the and the entire database, including all the treatments, all the diagnoses, all the, all the medications. And I think this is really the, <coughs> one of the fastest uh, ecosystems to do this kind of, of modalities. Now the question is, do we have enough information from the genetics and from the healthcare data to come up with interesting, um, interesting solutions for healthcare? So just a very brief vignette about you know, genes and geography. So, the, so this is what you can see there is a, is a uh, mathematical map of, of genetic differences projected um, uh, across different nations. So, and the Estonians are there, the, the circles and the square, square, and you know, up from us is, is, is Finland, down from us is Latvia, Lithuania, Russia, and uh, on my way, uh, right is the uh, Central and Western Europe. So you can see that actually the genes mirror, mirror the geography. And the same is true actually for Estonia. So within Estonia, we also see the differences. So, and why is it so? Because 200 years ago, no one took a bicycle and rode 200 kilometers to the other end of Estonia to find the, find the pride. You just took it, the girl, you know, next, uh, next no farm, next village, because you know you need to do farming, you need to do uh, you know hunting, no time for you know <coughs> lingering around. And so if we can, you know, say so vague things like who is coming from where, 
and, and what's the geographic uh, background, to me at least it seems obvious that we can also say something about the health. So what we have been doing <coughs> in the biobank over the past uh, couple of years, we actually have looked into the participants' genetic profiles, we have constructed uh, risk scores, you know, scored our participants based on their genetic risk. And this is just one of the reports that we are using, and this is for type 2 diabetes, and you can see it's very visual, so you have the the green that it's good, red that it's uh, it's bad. You know, when it's green, you are like yay. If it's green, red, you are like you know a little bit sad. It's quite you know visual to understand. And there we also give some advice. You know how you should you know modify your your lifestyle or maybe do some medical interventions in order to to keep this uh, keep yourself healthy. And the same way, very simple representation of the on the medications, again, there are algorithms and the knowledge bases that say, you know, for which drugs, for which and what type of drugs you should take, shouldn't take, what's the right dosage, again, very visual, you know, green, yellow, red. And the aim is that uh, in the near future, this information is not like direct to consumer app-based solutions, although there is space for that as well, but rather this to be integrated into the national healthcare system so that automatically the system knows when, when there is not just drug-drug interactions but also drug-genome interactions and your doctor has to make some slight changes, your uh, prescription, even before it's, it's prescribed. And there's always this constant question like, you know, oh, people will completely freaked out if they get their uh, genetic information, even if it's very bad, even if it says that you have 80% chance that you will get the breast cancer by age of, of uh, 60. And here you can see, you know, before, after, right after the counseling, and you know, six months later, actually you see that people are, you know, calm, they are uh, relaxed, they are content, you know, they're a little bit worried. And even if they are worried, they usually are very happy in a way that they got this information, because information is knowledge and it's important that we ourselves, but also the state, acts before a citizen becomes a patient. And then, for the future, what we did last year, we already <coughs> made a big effort to grow the biobank. So we basically took nine months to grow the biobank by 100,000 uh, participants. Actually, 70,000 of those participants were recruited in, in three months. And you know, while those numbers don't may seem impressive, you have to remind yourself that Estonia only has 1.3 million participants. So it's a rather big re representation. And so the aim is to, over the next years, uh, but my hopefully as quickly as possible, that every Estonian gets this genetic profile, which then can be used for, for healthcare, for basic research, but also for, for business creation. And for business creation, I think, uh, a mode of data accelerator is very attractive, both for founders but also for for, for investors, because it's a you know test fast, fail fast, and cheap model. Because you, the data is there, you can all very quickly test your ideas, accelerate your ideas. So if you have something in mind that may potentially be a successful business, and you think this type of data could help you, you know, please feel free to reach out. So my last slide is Estonia, all Europe ready for personalized medicine or data, driven medicine, you know, obviously because the data is there, the technology is there, the scientific knowledge is there, the public is ready for big data-based solution as well as, as, as policy makers. And what's most important, actually, people want this information. So thank you and uh, thank you for listening.